because the present is with you, the young people, because as soon as you start to get old, we're lost. Babies are born, nobody tells them that fire burns, they will put their hand. Nobody tells them there's an edge. They are inquisitive, they believe the world to be perfect, and then the world starts to teach them a lesson. You can't, you won't, it's not possible to be ideal, spark your ideals, and by the time you enter your first mortgage, you have to get real. So it is always the young people in whom we can entrust our hope for change. By the time you get to me, well, you still believe in change though. It's real, but it is the youth who keep the hope of change alive. I think the human race is a, an expression of courage. I think about the first person who looked in water and saw their face, saw their reflection. And what did they make of that? Would they have run? Imagine, would they have run? Would they have th thought they were being invaded? But they kept on. They didn't go in a corner and stay there and die. The story of the human race is a story of unending courage. And we have got to the 21st century and we are losing our courage. We are being told you have a place. Now he mentioned, the unmentioned, you know, taking us back to when things were good, better. Things were never better for us. We are a young society trying to come out of a past of pain. The good old days were days in which people knew their place and were, and were content to stay in their place to survive. We don't hanker after the good old days. Of course, we like the idea of the communities that we created to survive. And we have lost those communities by the process of urbanization and modernization and materialistic pursuits. And the challenge has been how to recreate new structures to take the progress that we are making and make it meaningful and to create new communities. And that's a challenge, and that's a very recent challenge for us. It's not, it's not the, um, the, the devastations of the moment ought not to be enough to tell us to run back and hide. So I want to put in perspective today the idea of courage within, I'm told, the context of accountability. Because without institutions that can be held accountable, courage is reduced to foolhardiness. If you are the one person who will stand up and blow the whistle, everyone around, and, and your institution cannot be trusted to hear that whistle and act on it. If it will cover up, then you are the fool that blew the whistle and lost your job. What does it, what is the worth of exercising courage in a society where the institutions are not there to support courage? Where everywhere you go, you're being told, as a young person, you will, you will get into the world of work, and one of the first things that will be told to you, and it will be told to you by your, often by your parents and your colleagues and everyone around you, they'll tell you to get real. They will tell you that if you think you can change the world, you're fooling yourself. This is how the system works. And that is the institutional framework that we have inherited from the very same past that we think are the glorious days. It's an it is an institutional framework where power is unaccountable, power is arbitrary, power can decide if you should be kept out or brought in, and if you're brought in on the terms on which you are brought in. And the challenge for us today is to force institutions to become accountable. We start in the home, the first institution of the family. The accountability that parents have to children. Then we go out into the world. 
And even, even last week in Parliament, I understand a Minister of Government told an opposition member, shut up and sit down. And that's, and that's, that's the nature of power. We have, on a day-to-day -day life, you go to the police station, hear how the police talks to you. They don't, you ask a question, why am I to do this? You're going to get bored at. Because that is power. You take off the uniform of the police officer and they become a mouse. People have so little power in their lives that the minute they have a little power, and you see it, you see it in the small ways, the security guard and so on, that the opportunity to exercise power is an opportunity to be what they have never been because the only model of power we have is power that is brutish. Our history has taught us that is what power is. So even reasonable people and I'm telling you, it's going to happen to us. Even reasonable people who have an, a different view of power as something that is generous, enabling, inspirational, and you are put into, us, into that system, you will find that very quickly you become the very thing that you are bored. And so my few minutes today is to talk about transforming the institutional framework. Because until that is transformed, courage is a risky thing. Courage is the one person who will always get their head chopped off. And I meet them all the time, the people who stood up. You know what happens to most of them? They go crazy. They meet you and they tell you over and over and over the same story of what happened to them. And they went to the court and they went to this because they have never got over the fact that they dared to do the right thing and the universe let them down. And all the people who were weak are the ones who are moving up in the world because the society is engineered to protect the status quo. It recognizes the virus of change and it sets out to destroy that virus wherever it finds it. If they can, they will, they, will, they will block you before you get in. If they figure it out, if you somehow outsmart it and get in because they got tricked, they will seek and destroy the minute you do. This is our society. This is how the status quo has managed to replicate itself over and over, plus a shahs, plus a mem shahs. How do you take that over now? I think it can only change from the individual acting in, in collaboration with others. It will change one at a time. It will change when I speak and somebody else recognizes in what I speak something they are saying and reach out, reaches out to me and say there are two of us now. And then some two other people reaches out and say there are four of us. One of the distinguishing features of this society is the engineering to create silos. This is a society in which you can live in a bubble and believe it's the world. And if you have that experience, if you have not noticed that experience, ask yourself why are you so often shocked by things in the society? If you knew the society, you'll never be shocked. You'll never be shocked that we had an attempted coup one day. You will never be shocked by the heinousness of crime. You will never be shocked by the fact that the good people come last. You will know that that is the nature of the society. And when you are shocked, it's because you are in a bubble. And this society has been created as all the, colon all the societies in the British West Indies have been created to be controlled through division. Because the most challenging thing to a minority authority force is unity collaboration, solidarities endanger that. And every time in our history you look back, whenever people came together, the status quo was threatened and fearful and, and came down heavy handed. We go back to 1987, we go back to 1970, over and over, when people start coming together, there's an intervention to block solidarities. And that is why I'm saying that the, the most radical thing we can do in order to turn that institutional framework upside down 
is to reach out across the divide, step out of our, out of our silos, inquire about the nature of the world outside of where we live. Imagine there are people who have never been to Matlot, never been to Balmain, Coover, where I am from, or Prisal Village, or Labre, or Sobo Village. It is ought to be a mission of the people of a small island like this to know, to know it so inside out that if ever you have the chance to exercise authority and, and, and you had the, the capacity to, the opportunity to, to, to prescribe for the society, you actually know the country, you actually know the society. Is it any surprise that we are bringing to the fore, not just in government, but in the police service and the chamber of commerce and everywhere leadership that doesn't know the place? And then we wonder about the dysfunction. So I will just end my few words, I think my time should be up by now, that <laughs> make a personal commitment. Have the courage to reach out to the forces that not only you don't know, but you might even be afraid of. Have the courage to listen, to walk in the shoes of the other. Then you might build on the basis of commonality rather than difference. Too often, the first thing we do is, what is different? What do we have different from each other? And we stop at the differences, nowhere to go after that. If we can find one thing in common, then we have a framework for engagement. When we have engagement, then we have something. And when we speak out, when we let our voices heard, I can guarantee you, you will hear more than an echo. We are never alone. We are encouraged to believe we are alone, and we are singular, and we are the exception. We are not the exception. There are more people like you out there than you can even begin to imagine. You just have to let them know you exist. Get in touch with the country. Thank you.